<laughs> well, uh, this is a real privilege. Uh, who are you? Oh, my name is Rick Rashid. Yeah. And what do you do? <laughs> um, I know I'm, what you do. But... I'm a senior vice president. I run Microsoft Research. And I really, I started Microsoft Research, you know, about uh, almost 17 years ago now, back in 1991. And you're here in Silicon Valley for the uh, Tech Fest, which, uh, or the Tech Roadshow. Road we show. call it the Roadshow because yeah. it's, you know, every year um, in Redmond, we do this thing called Tech Fest, yeah. you know, which is a huge display. We have uh, over 150 uh, different demonstrations that we do. And we, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very big event on campus. What we tried to do starting a few years ago was to bring some of that, you know, into the the campus here, the Mountain View campus for Microsoft, you know, both for employees but also for outside people that would come in. Yeah. And so it's a much scaled down um, roadshow, and uh, uh, but we have some of the the technologies uh, developed in Redmond, some of the technologies developed in other places, and 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 of course an emphasis on technologies developed here. Yeah. I, I know you're in a Star Trek, and uh, I, I, walking around the hallway there, I was like, I'm keeping track of which technologies are getting us closer to the holodeck, right? And there's uh, some uh, translation software out there, or it's services that are translating live between Chinese and English, right. and that sounds like uh, the, the computer you would talk to in the holodeck, you know, getting us a little closer there, and some of the touch stuff that Andy Wilson's doing is getting us a little closer to the kind of interactivity you would have in, in the uh, Star Trek. It, Tell me, do you fund things based on whether they're going to get you closer to a holodeck? No, we don't, actually. I mean, the, at, at the end of the day, the, the, the way I run my organization is that I really just hire great people. I give them an opportunity to do whatever they want to do. And, you know, it's the most important thing I do is, is to decide to hire someone or to let somebody go. You know, and it, it, you don't want to interfere with researchers. Yeah. Um, I think when you do, you limit you know, their creativity, you limit the output, and ultimately you wind up with poor research. Yeah. You know, so what we do is we, we give people an opportunity, an environment to, do, to be productive, and it has the advantage that I'm constantly surprised by what we do, because <laughs> I've never heard of it before, and suddenly I show up and, and, I, and people are showing me things I would never have ima imagined, you know. Um, you know, we've gotten it into areas, you know, like, um, uh, you know, HIV uh, vaccine work, where I would never have imagined we'd be doing that. But yeah. it's a natural consequence of work that we were doing on machine learning, you know, Bayesian reasoning and inference, you know, and how that relates to the analysis of, you know, the epitopes of, for, the, for the AIDS uh, virus. So it's, you know, you, I think the advantage of, of having that kind of free environment is that uh, you know, you're, you're, you're always sort of moving the state of the art forward and, and you really don't know exactly what you're going to get at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, but it is great when something looks like the holodeck. Yeah. And I love Andy Wilson's work. You know, the idea that he can have little virtual cars jumping over real, real ramps. You know, and uh, that's fun. That's just a fun thing. It's, it's pretty crazy what Andy does. I, he always amazes me when I, whenever I come and visit him. Well, part, and par, part of that is that you know, we're, we're getting to the point now where a lot of the technologies that, you know, back when I first started computer science in the, in the 70s, you know, were, were the things that people said, oh, we're, it's just around the corner, things like computer vision, you know, uh, text-to-speech, natural language processing, machine translation. Well, now actually have made huge strides. And in the last, you know, 10 years, all of those areas have changed dramatically. Yeah. A lot of that goes back to better algorithms, better ways of thinking of the problem, uh, but a lot of it also goes back to better technology. We can, you know, a lot of it's data driven, and we can now have v really vast amounts of data that we can use to build models. Well, and the costs of things are coming down too. I mean, I look at my cell phone, and it has a five megapixel camera on it that rivals a three thousand dollar professional camera. I've actually, on my blog, I did pictures of Half Moon Bay with both the, the cell phone and the, the professional camera, and you can still tell a difference, but it's getting pretty tough. Uh, and certainly, the stuff that Andy is doing relies on having lots of inexpensive s sensors. I think he's now using right. lasers. Tell me a little bit about what he's, well, he's showing off the he's, next door. He's using, well, it's a combination of, of using lasers, using computer vision technology that in this particular case is attuned to infrared light, you know, to be able to track the movement of hands on a screen mm -hmm. uh, and to be able to do interesting things. But it, it's really just 
again, more and more we can use things like general purpose real-time vision in really exciting new ways to solve some of these problems that have been around for a long time. We can now think about building really immersive interfaces where virtual and real interpenetrate because we have these kinds of you know, better vision technologies, we have um, you know, uh, much cheaper components, which of course make it all, make it all rational or reasonable to do. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's really exciting. You know, my, I, I will say my kids always think that uh, I'm just this, especially my really youngest kids, I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old and my two youngest, they, they think I'm an absolute dinosaur because you know, I talk about days when you know, a, a computer maybe had you know, a few thousand bytes of memory and they, they've never seen anything that didn't have a gigabyte. You know, it just it just never happened to them. Yeah. You know, and uh, well, my uh, my new son, I have a nine, an eight eight and a half month old, and he's never going to know a world that doesn't have a co connected device, a, a right. device that's connected to huge information stores. I mean, the reason I, I I was one of the first to see the worldwide telescope up at in Redmond, which is done in uh, your labs, and it just amazed it floored me because here we had access to terabytes of data, and we could navigate that through the click of a button, you know, which scientists haven't been able to see two pictures of a galaxy side by side just by clicking a button before, uh, and then be able to zoom back out and go over to another galaxy and zoom back in and go click, click, click and see the world, the universe in a new way. Tell me well, a little bit about that work that well, led I think, to that. Yeah, and I think, the, well, the Worldwide Telescope really, you know, in a way it's a combination of a long series of efforts, you know, started with Jim Gray's work in the Terra server going back to 1998. That was really kind of the first, you know, terabyte database on the internet. Yeah. And, um, and it had, you know, images of the Earth's surface, you know, that had been just on dusty decks. I mean, and believe me, these decks were dusty. I mean, they'd been sitting around for a while with the, at the U.S. Geological Service. And Jim and, and Tom Barkley working with him, you know, pulled these together and built a, a single representation that you could navigate through and you could see. And that started to change the way people thought about accessing this kind of information. Certainly, it, I mean, Jim won an award from the U.S. Geological Service. It changed the way they thought about the work that they were doing. Uh, you know, that then translated into the work he did with astronomers on the original uh, uh, sky survey, yeah. you know, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and uh, the, the something called the Sky Server that he built working with them. Uh, and and it's just you know it's it's gone on and Curtis. Wong um, and Jonathan Fay, who, who really you know, developed the Worldwide Telescope, and they, they built on that, that idea, those systems, uh, but then they brought to it sort of a new way of visualizing the information. I think what's exciting about the Worldwide Telescope for me is that it is a very general visualization engine. It can be used to visualize lots of different kinds of data. Not, it's, yes, it's being used for astronomy, but you could visualize photographs, you could visualize medical imagery, you could visualize, um, you know, virtual Earth kind of data. Yeah. Uh, you know, all sorts of things could be done there, and uh, and and to me again, that's that's really exciting. And you know, it's ironic in a way. And I, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, you know, one of the things the Worldwide Telescope does is it lets kids see the sky, really for the first time. I mean, ironically, technology took the sky away from us. Yeah. Right, all the all of the lights that we have in our cities. We we I remember growing up in a small town in Iowa. I'd look up, I'd see the Milky Way every night. I mean, most kids don't even know what that is. No. I mean they they've heard the term Milky Way, they've never seen it, and you know it's it's ironic in a way that now technology is bringing us back the sky. It's bringing yeah. us back those images, and even better. I mean, oh, things that you would never have seen before. And because even if you can see the Milky Way, you, you see, you know, what looks like one point of light. One, it looks like a star, right? Right. But when when I use the the worldwide telescope, I start zooming in, and I realize it's not a star at all. Well, it's well, a whole galaxy. Well, well, for the first time, I think you know when you look at these images, uh, and it wasn't like you couldn't have found the images before. It was just never convenient. It was never in one place. It was never integrated. It, it was never made as part of a panorama of a sky that you could look into, and for the first time, you can you can see these these galaxies and stars being born. I mean, it's so visually exciting, and uh, 
and again, I think this is just the starting point. I think this is a demonstration of what you can do with one kind of data set. And you know, we're going to continue to explore what you can do with other kinds of data. I've heard some rumors uh, about the numbers of people who've downloaded that in just the first month. Do you, are you releasing those in public yet? Or? Uh, I don't know all the data. I know the last time someone told me, it was, it was really, it's only been about a week now, if even quite a week. Uh -huh. uh, I know there have been over 10 million unique visitors. You know, wow. to, to the site. So um, it's, I think it really is resonating with people. And, and, I, and a lot of, I, I've had a lot of people come up to me t telling me that their kids have really enjoyed it. You know, they, they're really excited about it. And yeah. I, I was really excited. You know, I have a 14 year old son, and, you know, here is a tool that lets me help him get more excited about science. Well, and I think we forget sometimes how powerful the tools are that we've created. And we don't, we had a, a number of high school students here today. We brought like 120 or more high school students from the Bay Area in to see some of these demonstrations and try to you know, get them excited about science. We and I had a chance to talk with some of their teachers as well. Uh, I, we need to you know, find a way to, 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 to convey to young people that we have these incredibly powerful tools that for the first time a single person can do much more than they could ever do before. And that if you can learn a set of skills you know, in, in the technology area, um, it gives you an amazing power to accomplish things. And the, and the fact that we now have the kinds of computers and computer power that we have really gives that to, to individuals. And, um, the, uh, uh, I was telling the story of some of these teachers that my, my wife, who's also a computer scientist, uh, decided in, in January of this year to teach our seven and nine year old to program. Within three months, she, they're both programming in Visual Studio 2008 in C Sharp. And, and writing pretty sophisticated, I mean the nine year old in particular is writing quite sophisticated programs. I mean, he, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's using generics, he's using exception handlers. Well, he's, I'd expect your kids you know, to be doing that. Well, <laughs> well, or my wife's kids, I mean, she's, she's, she's very good. And, What's the and, key I, and I, think, I think the key thing there is that is, is, it, it, it's funny because my, my nine-year-old was talking to me about you know, how, ex, how much he likes it. You know, it went from being a lesson you know, that he was being taught to like, if I finish my homework, can I, can I use the computer and program? I mean, that's what happened. And, the, uh, and, and part of it was, and, and he, he used the same word to me, he, he, it lets him do things. It's a skill. It's empowering. Right? And I think we need to give our young people the power to change things and to make things happen. And I think stories like you know, the, the story of the Worldwide Telescope, it's, it's a hero story. It's a way to get people to realize you can still be a hero. Tell me about the new programming language that you're trying to design to help more kids learn to program. Oh, this is Boku. This yeah. is the, uh, the, the work that uh, Matt McLaren is doing. Uh, that's really an attempt to, to come up with some ways of, a, of, of instilling, even in extremely young kids, I mean, kids that maybe don't, don't even know how to read and write yet. Uh, it's really hard to use Visual Studio if you can't read and write. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, the idea, there, there's some very basic ideas about sequencing, um, about, you know, how you solve a problem through steps and through repetition. So very basic ideas of, of iteration. Very simple notions of, of subroutine, meaning that you can, here's a set of things that you can then connect with these sets of things. Um, and, and then do it in the context of controlling a cute little robot. You know, a cute little guy who runs around in the, on the screen and you can make him pick up things and, and drop things. And, uh, and I think, again, it's, it's, it's saying how can you, how can you take the, a kid's natural interest in, say, video games and translate that into a, a sense of, oh, I can solve a, a, some simple problems. I can make something happen. You know? And again, it's just it, the, the, the notion here isn't, in that particular case, it isn't giving a kid a, a skill to you know, write sophisticated applications, but it's to show them that they can make something. Right? It's not just other people that make things, that they can make something. And that's really the beginning of being an engineer, is when you believe you can do it. What else should I know about what's going on in Microsoft Research right now? We're working in so many different areas. It's the, 
I think that I think we're going through a period of really rapid change in many different fields of computer science, and you see that in areas like uh, uh, program analysis and and, and uh, 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 program proof technologies, where we're suddenly able to prove properties of, of huge you know, million line programs we never could do before. We can we have practical ways of proving program termination. Never really could do that before. What that means is that we can now see to the sort of the end, to the future, where we can build much more reliable systems than we've been able to do. I mean, in some sense there, I think we're beginning to really understand computer science, right? I mean, the, the joke always was, you know, if, if, if it was really a science, it wouldn't have the word science in its name, you know? <laughs> uh, but I think we've actually, if you look at the way the field has evolved now, we have a much better understanding of what a program is, much better understanding of what what computers really do, uh, and and we're under, we're beginning to understand how how to think about people using computers. So, you know, some of the work we're doing here in Silicon Valley in privacy, where we're, we're having mathematical models that really define what it means to have private information. Yeah. It's not something that's just an anecdotal notion of privacy. It's not just you know, well, he got my stuff or he didn't get my stuff. It's it's how do you prove that you either can protect your information or you can't, yeah. you know, and and I think that's you know putting these these concepts on a firm, you know, theoretical basis, a firm logical foundation. I think that's really important, and I think we're beginning to do that. Thank you so much. Hey, nice talking with you. This was really an honor.